Hi there, in this video I'm going to give you five tips to take better garden bird photographs. So whether you're completely new to garden bird photography or want to improve your existing skills, I'm sure you'll find something useful in this video. So what I've done is I've combined my 10 years of experience taking photographs of garden birds into my top five tips. So if you're a regular to the channel, you've probably heard me say most of these things before, but I thought it'd still be useful to condense all of these tips into a top five list. So hopefully what I'm going to do is help you to enjoy your photography. I've split my five tips into two sections. The first two are practical tips and the last three are more to do with how to set up your camera to get the best effect. So I hope you'll find something useful. Let's go on to tip number one. So the first thing to consider is location. Now I'm really lucky where I am, I've got a lot of space around the house and I've converted this shed here behind me into a hide. What I've done is I've poked holes in the shed so I can point the camera at the feeders and I get really good shots of the birds. But I've also considered where the sun will be at different times of day, what the background is behind the feeders, um, just to make sure I get the best possible photograph. But if you're not as fortunate as me to have all the space and the opportunity opportunity to set up a hide in a shed, there are other things that you could do. I first started taking photographs of birds from a tent, um, so I used that as a hide and then I bought a little portable pop-up hide and I've even made a video where I took photographs of birds just from my kitchen window, so I'll put a link to that down below in the description. Tip number two is to try and make your photographs seem as natural as possible. Now clearly you're going to have to attract the birds to your garden with some kind of feed. Now there's lots of different kind of feed you can put out. At the moment I've got sunflower hearts here in this feeder, niger seed here in this feeder, then I've got a mixed seed um, on, a, on a table and down on a ground feeder. But there are lots of other kind of feed that you can put out to attract different kinds of birds. But birds landing on feeders like this don't obviously look like they're in their natural environment. So next to these feeders, what I've done is I've attached some twigs. Um, at the moment, they're attached to this cross beam here, which is really useful. And you've probably heard me say before that these are just attached with Velcro. So it's very quick to take them off and change them out for a different twig just to make everything look a bit different. So it's important to do things a little bit differently and be creative as well when you're thinking about perches. Just here we've got an old gate that we were going to throw away. So I just chopped one of the ends off that was really interesting and I've used this as a perch. So here's a picture of a bird just sat here on the top of this gate. But I've also used things like um, garden tools. So here's a picture of a juvenile robin on the top of a spade handle. I really like this one. And I've also got photographs of birds on the top of a watering can. So it's just interesting to try and think of different ways that you can use um, things that you can find around the environment as perches. So just here I've got two freestanding stumps that make for very interesting perches. Um, I've just put some cross pieces on the base of them to make them stand up. The far one was um, found on the floor in a local wood so I just carried it home. And this one um, we were cutting down some trees that had blown over in a storm and I like this one in particular because it got this circular pattern here so the birds can go in to get some food and then I can take the picture as they come out of the hole. If you really want to get creative with your perches, you could build something like this, which is a reflection pool. And if this does interest you, I'll put links down below in the description to videos where I made this pool and I've taken photographs using it. That's it for the practical tips. I'll move on to tip number three, which is going to be a technical tip. Now, this is not going to be an equipment video. I have actually made a video where I talk about um, the best lenses for wildlife photographs. So again, I'll put a link for that down below in the description. But my third tip is to do with having really good sharp focus. So there's nothing worse than seeing a photograph that's blurred or out of focus. And there are loads of ways that you can work to get your shots sharper and more in focus. 
The first thing to do to make sure you get in focus shots is to make sure your camera is really stable while you're taking the photograph. And you can do that by putting it on a tripod or as I've got here, a bean bag to hold it really still. Or if you've not got those available, even just resting it on a wall or a post, anything to just reduce any camera shake. The second thing to be sure of is how your camera actually focuses. Most cameras are set up so that when you half press the shutter button, it will acquire a focus lock. And then when you fully press the shutter button, it will take the photograph. And it's really important to make sure that the camera has acquired a focus lock first before you actually press the button. But what I've done on my camera is I've set a button on the back to be the autofocus button. And this is known as back button focusing. I prefer this method because it allows you to separate the action of pressing the shutter button uh, and trying to focus at the same time. And I've got a dedicated button, but it also allows you to take your finger off the shutter button, keep your finger on the autofocus button so the focus lock remains active. Now, the third thing to consider is the shutter speed that you've got your camera set on because you want to try and freeze the action of the bird. Now, if your camera is set up like this one on a beanbag or it's on a tripod, then that will cut out any movement that your hand might introduce. So the shutter speed will be slightly less matterable and you could cope with having a slightly slower shutter speed. But then you may have the problem of the birds themselves moving. Now, if the birds are moving into the shot and are not completely still, then you'll also need a fairly fast shutter speed to freeze their action, especially if you're intending to get birds in flight. So on to tip number four. Many people will have seen photographs that look very cinematic of wildlife where the subject is in really sharp focus, but the background is blurred to a point where it's almost one solid color. Now this is achieved by controlling what's called depth of field. Basically what depth of field means is how much of the image is an acceptable focus. Now it's really difficult for a camera to take a photograph where everything front to back is pin sharp. You have to make the most of what the camera can give you and just accept the best possible outcome. Now there are ways of controlling how much is in sharp focus and the way that you do that is by changing the size of the hole in the camera that the light goes through and this is known as the aperture. Now if you make a very big hole this is a big aperture and it's denoted by a small f number which is slightly counterintuitive. So something like an f4 will be a fairly large hole but if you add an f16 then that hole becomes a lot smaller. Now what happens as you make the hole bigger then you get a shallower depth of field which means that less of the image is in focus. Now some lenses will go as wide as an f2 or even wider and this means that you've got a really really shallow depth of field and sometimes this can be the difference between a bird's beak being in focus but its eye not being in focus. The issue is as you start to make the depth of field larger by decreasing the size of the aperture then more of the background starts to come into focus. So the thing to do is to try and get your subject as close as you can to where you're sitting and the background as far away as you can from where the lens is and use an aperture that allows you to get a depth of field so you can get all of the bird in focus but the background goes out of focus. Now, tip number five is to make sure that your images are exposed correctly. There's nothing worse than seeing an image that's too dark or too bright. And the best way of doing this is to use a semi-automatic exposure mode because this takes all the hassle out of thinking about what the camera is doing and you can just focus on taking a really good shot. The semi-automatic mode I prefer when taking photographs is aperture priority. Now, most cameras will use the letter A on the mode dial to um, select aperture priority. If you're using a Canon camera, then they use AV to select the aperture priority mode. 
but it doesn't matter what kind of camera you're using, the Aperture Priority still does the same job. It allows you as a photographer to decide how big the aperture is going to be. And so that means that you choose how big the hole is in the lens, which allows you to control the depth of field. So you can decide how much of the image is an acceptable focus. The smaller the hole, so the bigger the F number, the larger the depth of field and vice versa. So if you want to put the background completely out of focus, you need a larger aperture. So what I'll do is I'll leave you with some of my favourite shots that I've taken of birds in my back garden. Well, I hope you found those tips useful and you can take away something that will help you to improve your photography. But really the best way of improving is to just get out and practice because you learn from your mistakes. And don't forget, making mistakes is a good thing as long as you learn from them. And as I always say, find something that you enjoy because nothing is more important than you enjoying your photography. Now that certainly wasn't an exhaustive list of tips. If you have any more questions, then watch out for any of my future live streams where you can ask me your questions. Leave them down below in the comments or nip over to my Instagram account and leave me your questions there. Now if you like what I do on the channel and want to help support me to make future content like this, then you can also visit my Teespring store. There I've got a range of merchandise on offer, like the t-shirt that I'm wearing now, and it really helps the channel. So go and check that out. There's a link for that down below in the description. And also, don't forget the super thanks button. But you don't have to spend any money at all to support the channel. You can do that simply by clicking like, subscribe and the bell notifications because it really helps me out and it makes sure that you don't miss out on any future content. Watch out for next week's video. That goes live on Sunday. In the meantime, go and check out this video just up here. But all that's left now is to say, stay safe and I'll see you soon.